Bonjour and good morning here to the third day at Printing United in Las Vegas. And I am so pleased to have good friends in the studio. We have uh, Chris Manley on a very late note, uh, Eric Vessels. I guess you don't need introductions anyway. Bonjour. And my co-host, dear friend, Pat McGrew. So guys, uh, welcome here this morning. I mean, third day, last day. Uh, Chris, how has it been for you guys? Oh, it's been a great show. I mean, just way beyond expectations and uh, Yes, yeah, so, so glad to be here. So your stand looked a little bit different this year. It, it, it had sort of a diff, slightly different vibe to it. How did people react? Because we all know the Grafco stand. We, we, we know it well, we know what to expect. So how did people react this time? Well, so first of all, let's talk about maybe what might be a perceived negative. We did not have a large RMGT offset press That's this true. year. Obviously, with Drupa only being three months ago, it was very difficult to work that all out logistically, et cetera. You, you did have heavy metal, though. You we had did. heavy metal. We did have. I'm talking about the camper or? <laughs> <laughs> heavy course. aluminum, as a matter of fact. Heavy, heavy, heavy aluminum, as yeah. a matter of fact. So, yeah, this is our third exhibition with the Airstream, and that's yeah. kind of become fun, and that's I right. certainly enjoy it. I mean, it. I always look for it. I, I, I love the way you... I love the right way you decorate it, and, and I love the setup, but it, I think it's, it's one of those icons we look for on the floor. It's kind of how I orient myself when I'm walking up and down the aisle. Well, the cool thing about it is it's driven to the show. Yeah, That's true. It's That's insane. True. It's driven so, to the show. You should have one that's on bigger so you can just have an RMTT machine inside it, right? Well, we could <laughs> perhaps create a model that size. We could just do a road show every day of the month. It's either that or you live in the Airstream on the show floor yeah. while you're here. Well, we could probably save some expenses that way, but my wife has told me that that is verboten. So. Okay. Well, the other interesting thing that, that you guys are doing there in front of the Airstream is you guys are also doing video. So I think I've, I find it interesting that more and more people are creating content mm. for themselves, mm. right? There's a lot of content creation happening in the industry, but you're seeing people create their own content. I know Jim's working with you guys doing that. Yeah. How's that been? Well, so first of all, Jim has done a tremendous job with that. Jim Luttrell with Socios has been our um, yep. PR guy for a long time. Five or six years ago, actually, right before Corona, my wife and I went to Content Marketing World, mm -hmm. which for some strange reason is in Cleveland, Ohio every year. And there are people from all over the world. Okay. It's primarily a B2C type of, of, uh, of event. So when they're talking about how to market Pepsi-Cola and Budweiser, it wasn't really pertinent to a printing press or a collating machine or a CNC router. But inspiration maybe. In many ways it is. Yeah. Yeah. And what it's really about is the, is, is the throwing your heart over that fence that mm -hmm. content marketing is still probably one of the most effective tools in, in er, Eric, I can't help think about because I mean, uh, you have your Tactiful logo on and yes. you're now the CXO of, uh, of uh, Tactiful and the first time in many years that you are not with what I think. How is it for you to be here at Printing United? It's weird. It's Can different. Imagine? It's yeah. different. Yeah, it's a total context shift. I find myself walking around. I, I mean, first of all, it feels really good in the industry and it always has to walk around and not be able to walk through without people grabbing, hey, right. how are you, how are you, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. always feels really good. You get blisters from the hugs. But for, for sure, I got a little, you know, on my back, it's like I'm gonna have to get some lotion. But I find myself like, oh, I'm not, I don't need to view it through that frame, through that lens, right? Mm -hmm. So taking on the role at Tactical and working with Kevin Abergel, a really good friend of mine, um, you know, when everything went down with what they think, it was a, what do I do? I was going to walk across the country, mm. shelve that yeah, idea for a minute. I wanted to talk to you, and I said, okay, instead of eight weeks, it became like two hours, and I thought, okay, that's a short one. It was right? longer than two hours. <laughs> yeah, it was longer I'm than just two kidding. Hours. <laughs> but it, no, I mean, I have, I mean, most people that know me know I've, I've got kind of a nervous in energy, an entrepreneurial spirit, like just constantly want to be doing something and what Kevin and, and Tactful are doing is super freaking interesting and it's super and you cool. told me that that your let's say passion for what Tactful does was actually way before any of these things happened because you've always been very engaged sure. with uh, with what they do basically yeah absolutely yeah. I mean Kevin and I like I said are friends we met I think at uh, Drupa 2012 mm -hmm. uh, when he was still with MGI yeah. Um, and followed sort of that career. And then when he started Tactiful as friends, we talked and then we sat down what they think to Tactiful and was like, hey, like, 
you should be talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we created a content partnership, still exists. Mm -hmm. He does a digital embellishment show there. Mm -hmm. uh, he does a lot of, uh, a lot of content marketing mm -hmm. around that Cabin space. Theory. So that's, um, I that's can, something that I was can really- I can't think about because as a CXO, I think that maybe people, I think it's like short for chief experience officer. It's kind of like a marketing role, but maybe extended a little bit, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's new to me, and it, it was kind of, we kind of laughed about it. I was like, what am, what am I going to do, right? And, and I wanted to be involved. So in job the, first and then title. Yeah, well, we sort of searched for a title, right? And, and Kevin was really creative. He, he's like, what about this? I'm like, well, what is that? I don't, I'm not really sure what it was. And the reason that we went with that was because I can touch all areas and be involved in the strategy, because mm -hmm. that's something near and dear to me because I've just, yeah. I've got that mindset of like, you know, strategy, entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so for me, what a chief experience officer is, is I'm making sure that all of the experiences that Tactical has with anyone, whether it be a customer, a partner, someone that doesn't know us, um, is great. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to be heading up the training programs, which we're going to be very invested in because mm -hmm. there's a large need mm -hmm. in that space for education, teaching people, because a lot of printers don't know how to price it correctly. They don't know how to design for it. They don't know how to market it. They don't know how to sell it. And there's so much money being left on the table there, um, so we're we're trying to we're trying to help with that. And then the software products, which is new to me, I'm not a software, well, I'm not too, a developer right? or a software guy, but I am a creative, and I see what and, they're doing and with these it. software. I built to support what you just said about how to price things better, how to design better, how to see things. So I mean, I think that that is perfect. I was just thinking, uh, Chris, because when we talk about uh, digital embellishment and embellishment in general, I mean, you don't have any products specifically on that segment. You have, you have, of course, some foiling, uh, but when I mean, you look as, a, as an owner of a distribution setup, I mean, is that something that you see a growing interest in, or is it still a little bit like in the beginning, or, or where, how do you see it? Well, so, First of all, Graphco, through our relationship with both Kevin, his father, his uncle, his aunt, back 10, 15 years ago, we placed three of the first four Jet Varnish 3D machines in oh, all of North okay. America. So you are in the business, basically. And honestly, if Tactiful existed at the same time that MGI was pioneering this and Graphco was their distribution partner in four or five states, mm -hmm. I think we would have sold 30 of those machines because what you just said and what Kevin's now addressing was the primary challenge. How do I market it? How do I price it? Yeah. You know, if you were literally trying to chase a peanut distributor to once a year do the front cover of their mm. Christmas catalog, yeah, yeah. you were going to go out of business because yeah, 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 you're only yeah, selling yeah. one job a year, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And what Kevin, um, and now with Eric's help, is going to be able to roll out is just going to be phenomenal. Yeah. But, you know, back to that content marketing thing. Oh, Kevin sorry, was really, no, 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 yeah, but yeah, Kevin yeah. was really a pioneer. And this is more about his new boss. Mm -hmm. um, so Kevin was really a pioneer in this, and this is what this young man did when he had just started working for his dad. Mm -hmm. He and one of their French colleagues went in front of the um, Louvre mm -hmm. with jet varnish 3D mm -hmm. content, mm -hmm. and they just pulled people off the street and said, basically, what do you think of this? Would this yeah, make yeah. you want to buy tennis shoes? Yeah, yeah. Would this want you to buy a lipstick? Yeah. And the people were all like, holy crap, yes, yeah, yeah. that's the best thing I ever saw. Mm -hmm. And we used that dramatically. The problem was that it was like a QR code before Corona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What good was a QR code yeah, before yeah, yeah. Corona? No one even knew what to do with it. Yeah. It was and a technology without a use case. Right, yeah. and we were like trying to email this to people and like, well, that file's really big. Yeah, yeah. It's clogging up my iPhone, you know, and all the okay. things that you my, had. My, my favorite QR thing, my QR code thing is, is on a road sign. Yeah. No. I can't do anything with that. Unless yeah. you can get your dash cams to store them, right? <laughs> Automatic recognition, <laughs> maybe, yeah. someday. Who knows? Yeah, but we but, don't have a lot of those. Pat, I can't help think because, I mean, we have done print sample TV for many years now. Yeah. I mean, you also experienced uh, a lot of print samples with... Uh, Kevin's samples were a lot of my go-to samples, especially when in the, in the early days when we were... I love collecting print samples, right? For me, they're inspiration I can take to other people who are trying to solve problems, looking for new things to sell, new ideas. A lot of times you'll see something in Australia you've never seen anywhere else, some, something in Brazil, Singapore. And when you started to first see people using embellishment outside of the just throw in some gold foil on something or some, right, I mean, because we, we know that, we understood it. 
And, and Kevin ha always had these wild ideas, and he probably never realized I was stalking him, mm -hmm. but I was, sure. <laughs> because I knew that wherever he was, there was going to be a really cool print sample. And European shows, you know, you, you'd get to where the MGI was, and yeah. people just stopped dead, mm -hmm. right? But the problem was that when I would talk to printers about, you know, well, have you thought about, you know, looking at these kinds of embellishment things? And, and in the early MGI days, the early Skodix days, you know, and, and even the, the cold foiling, when I would talk to printers, it was always the same story. Well, you know, uh, my customers don't want to pay extra. My customers don't want to do... So your point about education is so relevant because it's not that they won't pay for it. They will pay for it. They will pay for Absolutely. it. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about, it's all about the ROIs, basically, right? Yeah. Well, there's a lot. Of, so so we're, we're doing some presentations here at Printing United at, at both Sharp and Xerox, and in our presentation, we talk about data that's coming in about consumer behavior, right? And one of the things that studies have shown is that if you see something and then touch it, you are willing to pay a 33% premium 33. for that. Right, and 50, it, you'll notice it, if it's embellished, you'll notice it 50% more of the time, right? So if you, and we know that if you see it and then you touch it and then you hold it, you buy it. Yeah. So that's the, that's the power of embellishment. I think printers yeah. are learning to teach their customers this. And we, yeah. one of, of the- It takes some time that's to get true. there, but it will, they, it will, they will get there. And sure. one of the things I like about, uh, I was a little bit, I wouldn't say skeptical in the beginning, but I remember that in the beginning of Tactiful, it was very much about the, the foils and the, and the varnishes and, and, and like, but you extended it to be also just beyond CMYK and, and using Fifth and different color, color spaces. Yeah. Yep. And I think that when you look at the iridescence and if you look at the, uh, the, some of the digital devices with more than four colors, uh, some of the examples you also see here at Printing United, just stunning, right? Because yeah. it, it, it pops your eyes in, in a way that is simply, because we're so used to the CMYK space, right? So, uh, so it's, a, it's a different shade, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so that, and that's, that's what we say is like, take CMYK, or take ordinary print and make it extraordinary by just, and it's simple to do. And a lot of these devices are in place and they're underutilized. Mm -hmm. So a part of what we're trying to do with the eight week training program that Tactical has is do that education for the folks that like, hey, you have this, mm -hmm. so utilize it. Um, and yeah, it's fun. But the software part, so the pricing is really important, Pat, I think, because the Tactify software mm -hmm. enables printers to actually figure out what is the best price for their market. And we use uh, AI and like some 28 different variables, like cost of eggs, cost of milk, in that zip code, you, in the vertical. You all understand that. It's like a, a in market the, index I of had goods. A, I had a, it's, it's like Kelly Blue Book. And then applied yeah, the to print. I had a great with Kevin where he explained it, and I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what that does for a printer is they're able to, with use, utilizing data and AI technology, and as we build out this network, it'll get smarter, right? Because it'll say, what are all the other printers getting for this particular piece in this vertical, this application? Yeah, yeah. And what am I getting historically? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's going to be different, mm -hmm. but you can have your, your AI model will learn mm -hmm. along with the larger network will learn. So we call it, and we call it getting in the sweet spot. So if you're in that sweet spot, you're never leaving money on the table. Mm -hmm. And our, some of our beta testers, the salespeople were just like, I can't charge that for that, right, Pat? And that's they sold a, it anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. And, well, and, and we say to them, the value proposition. do it. Mm -hmm. Sell it at Being that price and let me know. Never and they came fair lady, right? They came back and said no pushback. Yeah. They were um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, because I know that we're all busy. So I just have because I want to touch upon one more topic that I talked to Eric about before. So Chris, um, when Eric uh, posted some time ago that uh, that he was not with what they think anymore. I think it was like a shock for a lot of us. I mean, we know Eric for many years, and we have had our fights, but uh, but it's uh, I think it's always uh, been respectful and things like that. But but I mean, how how was it you? You're an industry player here in the U.S. How was it for you to to have the man leaving the ship, right? Well, first of all, Eric and I were on the phone. Out. I was going to say it about <laughs> well, we were on the phone at about 7:15 that morning after sure. I saw it. Yeah. You know, because we do go all the way back, and actually, the fellow that founded his company and my dad were quite good friends oh, yeah. right. back in the day, both from Kentucky, by the way, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, like the Kentucky Fried Chicken? 
well. <laughs> Derby, bourbon. There you go. Honestly, my, my, my great-grandfather was offered one of the first franchises and didn't, couldn't scrape together the six grand it cost. I would never be selling printing machines now, I'll tell you that, if I, I'd be a Kentucky Fried Chicken millionaire. But anyway, um, no, I mean. So it would be a chicken, Chris? All right, let's leave that one alone. So um, first of all, I was for sure shocked. Mm. I, I feel like there's already a huge void. I'm just mm. gonna be candid, mm. you know? I mean, there are companies, a Xerox, for example, or something that are like a big enough organization that the CEO leaving, as long as it's done properly, can maintain mm. continuity. Mm. Companies the size of what they think or honestly a Graphco, or frankly, when you come down to it, 90% of the printing companies in this country, because they're almost all family businesses or, you know, sort of a charismatic leader kind of management um, approach, changes that are that tumultuous are very seldom, you know, easy to do. And it's gonna be it's gonna be a big boy. Yeah, I mean, it would be if you left Inca. Yeah, that would be the same. I mean, I mean, yeah, and and we are younger than you guys, and you have uh, still been so instrumental. Um, we agreed that we didn't talk too much about it, but one of the things that I, I asked you if it was okay to ask was, I mean, personally, I mean, the most emotional thing that you went through must have been uh, so many waves and so many thoughts. That you know what, though, I think his Absolutely. I think his kind of spiritual outlook on life moved him through that I, I'm sure a about hell that. of a lot faster than some guy who's sort of conflicted about where he is in the world in the yeah, first yeah. place. Good and that's a, and you should, I mean, and I, I'm saying this now and I don't want to get us all, you know, funny <laughs> here, <laughs> but I know exactly funny here, but I mean, I really do mean that because I know how you live your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I also know dozens of other people that could lose a job as a district yeah. manager for some copier company yeah. and it'd take them six months to get over it and they'd be writing mean things on LinkedIn yeah. and this guy's back up and at it by the Monday after almost. Well, that, so. I mean, I think the first thing that I would, I would speak to on that, yeah, the way I live my life, yeah. I like change is inevitable. It's the only yeah. thing constant is change and I'm, I had that outlook, but also the relationships, I think, the, the, the fact that I talked to you I mean, so quickly. I mean, when you see how many uh, so voices many that supported you, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. There, were, there were a lot of different things that I could have done, really, and a sabbatical was one of them that I, yeah. that I could have done. Um, but the outpouring of support, the outpouring of support here, um, and just the friendships, you know, because for me, it's never really been all about business. And as you know, and I've said this many times, and Pat, you know this, yeah. like, at what they think our culture was about, is this good for the industry? And then how do we make money? And that speaks to people, right? Like that speaks to those relationships. So, I mean, that's what really made me like, in a week or two, I was just like, ah, it's gonna be all right. It'll be, it'll be fine, you know? It's, it's weird, yeah. it's different, but it's fine. But the fact of the matter is, and let's just speak clearly and transparently, you know, what they think was acquired. Yeah, yeah. And when you make that move, yeah. right. you are now, like you're, you don't, you don't own it, yeah. and, and, and yeah. they make decisions that they can make, yeah. and, and, those, and you can agree or disagree with yeah. those strategic decisions. But that's what they do, basically. Yeah. And time will tell, yeah. and you know, everything will be as it is. But I, I think what I want people to know is that the, the industry is dynamic, and voids get filled, mm. and we change, and we move, and I'm thrilled to still be here talking to you guys because I could be doing something completely different out of the industry. I love the fact that I still have some touch in the industry and, and hope to for a long time because I love it. I mean, I think we should be pretty happy still to have Eric around, right? I, I wouldn't, I don't want to think about an industry where Eric is not That's around. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and I have to tell that. you, uh -huh. well, and I'll tell you why. Because, so I was a what they think person before Eric was, which yeah. is kind of weird, wow. but uh, I worked with Randy. Yeah. And uh, I actually covered Drupa for Randy in 2000, okay. right? And then things which happened. Was the founding year. Yeah. And, and oh, so, was it? 2000. Oh, yeah. 2000. And, and it was the, you know, do you think you could go and walk around and get us some content for 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 what they think? And I'm like, sure. So I mean, because I, I love creating content, it was it was a natural relationship. It, it was a lovely relationship. And then as as Eric and 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 then and Adam came in and and we we transitioned into sort of some bigger visions, really, yeah. and and different ways and approaches. I've always been lucky enough to be 
a, a freelancer hanging on the coattails. But you are good at hanging on. <laughs> but, but honest to God, the, the, the idea, just watching your growth in the industry yeah was amazing and then watching the brand's growth in the industry was amazing. Well, that was the model, right? The model in the early days and, and when you were involved with Randy, I was still in the automotive industry um, as a, a microscopic dirt and paint analyst. Like I came up from my dad worked in the auto industry and I, I learned that skill and was doing it. The downturn of the economy, I got fired. <laughs> You know, it's not the first time, guys, not the first time, yeah. but it was just, you know, it was just the economy and nobody really cared about the quality of paint leaving the exit of the auto shops. And so my, I was kind of deprecated in there. And I had obviously already been talking to Randy. I'd actually been helping do some work on the back end with what they think in 2001 time frame. So in 2002. So you were actually very early involved in yeah, that. Friends. Yeah, friends. It's almost this, almost exactly like Tactical. I was friends with a person that was doing a thing. I was interested in the thing. I'm going to do the thing. So 2002, I came into it. Which 2002 yeah. was when Carrie Shervern came yeah. into what yeah, they yeah, think, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about it is Carrie said, eh, I'll do a few articles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how been, many has it done now? It's been 22 years, oh, right? Yeah. But Found. that's the but that's yeah. the that's the power of the culture of what they think. And you we spoke to it. You spoke to it. It's a network of freelancers. Yeah. What we wanted to do was like find smart people and let them speak. My total to direction day, from what the they model. think was always just, just you, you go you see stuff go write about it yeah. <laughs> and that was it's 100 percent that yeah. and, and and same thing you know same thing with kevin hey you're smart about this subject talk about it mm -hmm. and that grows and you know same thing right you do videos with smart people that's mm -hmm. valuable content people enjoy consuming that content so it's it's it well, here's was another thing to fun. think about and i think i think this is kind of an interesting juxtaposition this young man Makes a, makes a job change, let's just call it that, right? Yeah. And Mark Mickelson, after almost four oh, yeah. decades, yeah. Yeah. four decades yeah. as editor-in-chief yeah. yeah. of what became and the just, biggest magazine just, of all. And just imagine how many and changes in the, those four, four oh, decades, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. One, of so heroes, yeah. one of my heroes, one of my heroes, by the way. When, when, I, I stalked him, too. When we, were, when we were first starting uh, What They Think, we were watching really closely what Mark did. Um, and at the time, there was a shift happening and we accelerated the shift from this 30 day printed magazine news to, and people told us in the beginning, nobody wants to read a daily email newsletter. You guys are crazy. No right. one wants oh, news absolutely. about the industry Maybe. every day, right? Yeah. And then later, like 10 years later, I had PR people coming to me saying, you are the reason I have a business oh, really? because there's a demand for news every single day. Oh, sure. So those are the shifts. Yeah. And so, that was very early in this, yeah. I don't mean just the printing industry. Yeah. I mean, I, remember, all I, I, I can tell you that uh, one of the first times I met uh, Adam and Eric, and, and you know, I, I knew what they think, and you had a lot of camera gear, and I was just like, oh, kind of starstruck about meeting uh, the guys. And we spoke about, as I think I said to Eric, I think we've done about 100 or 200 videos. He said, yeah. I think we were up to two, three thousand videos at that time. For sure. yeah, it's over four thousand now. Yeah, because you were so you were so early movers in, in that. In two thousand eight, uh, yeah, two thousand eight. Yeah. Well, because we weren't. I mean, here's the thing, and this is the business philosophy, and you'll you'll back me up on this. You can't be scared to try things. Yep. No, no. You can't be scared to fail. But what I always say is, don't ever fail big. Mm. Always fail small. Yeah. Fail incrementally. Small. Guys. Fail, fail fast. Fail, fail small. And I love that from you. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, you know. I think we could talk forever because we have so many topics to talk about. But uh, I know, Chris, you have to go and sell a few more uh, RMTTs. And but I do have a little good news I'd love to share. Okay, if I could. okay. So a marketing opportunity. Bring it on. Well, you know, um, we certainly started this conversation with the the the. the, the admission, let's call it, that we weren't able to bring a big 80,000 pound printing press to this year's show. Sure. The great news is that yesterday, on that exact day, two different RMGT presses went under contract, sold by Grafco. One is a five color with coder that is going to a company in Orlando that is 125 years old and a woman owned enterprise. Whoa. So that is, Whoa. like that's noteworthy, I think, you know. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And the second company is um, a company called the National Group in um, Indiana mm -hmm. and in Lafayette, and they um, are buying their second RMGT press, placing a machine from a certain 
gray colored German printing machine company, you know, okay, and that's our that, second one. There could be three different options, so we that's don't true. we don't know that's what true. you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. Something. But anyway, that was very exciting, and actually a bunch of other machines went under contract too. This has been a really good mm. show, and I think it's a bellwether for the industry mm. that while the general economy is certainly scary and very inflationary, we know that. Mm. People are still making lots and lots of investments. So, so uh, let's end on a high note. You sold some machines. You got a fantastic job. We have done a lot of print sample TVs, and I know that you have been busy here. And we have done, I think, 30, 40, we have 50. 50 and the DJs, the DJs. 50. And we have, uh, That's our exit music. You do not music. need to see these two guys dance, that's <laughs> no, no, for sure. No, no, no. But you can, Hi, I'm a good hey, dancer. You can you beatbox to that one, right? I can, I can, maybe. <laughs> Great, thank you very much for being here. And, uh, Thanks very much. All of us, let's do it. All right, All right. thank you. Wonder Great. Twins, activate. Yeah.